you for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, we're here today to talk about your latest book, how something that may shock and discredit you. Yes, and I was actually going to start before you and I uh, begin chatting by reading a bit from the book. So um, it's divided into a number of chapters and interludes, mostly during the 18-month period of my life where I was very, very hard at work making sure I didn't transition. Uh, this is from chapter six, which is the stages of not going on T. T being short for testosterone. It's a sex hormone. You can inject it right into your body if you want. Oh, I don't want to go on T. That's not what this is. I can see where you got the idea, I suppose, but I'm afraid hormones simply aren't for me. I don't even want the ones I have. I'll never go on testosterone, but it's just wonderful for you. You look great. Better than ever, honestly. If I were stuck in a room for the rest of my life and could only look at one thing for some reason, it would be you. I hope that's not weird to say. But that's really not the same thing. I just want you to go on hormones and for me to be able to watch you do it. And if you ever wanted to share the occasional update, like a few day-by-day -day updates on how you're doing, maybe just a daily journal about what tea is doing for you, what effects you're noticing, that sort of thing that I could read or watch or otherwise follow along with from the comfort of home where I'm not on hormones, that would be ideal. But that's it for me. I'm not sure I even want hormones. I'm pretty sure I don't want them because I think about going on hormones all the time. And those thoughts always end on some variation of I can't, not ever. And if I really wanted to try hormones, obviously I wouldn't keep thinking about how I can't try them. I think about them all the time and I have to constantly stop myself, so I must really not want them. You know how when you're profoundly curious and sick with longing about something, it usually passes pretty quickly? It's an idle fixation brought on by boredom, easily confused with legitimate desire. Don't worry, lots of people confuse the two. And it doesn't help seeing all these attractive and powerful trans people getting into their stretch limousines and then going on the news to promote hormone therapy as a universal panacea for solving all your problems. Happens all the time. Frankly, I'm sick of it. I certainly don't need hormones. See, I've got all these coping strategies. Look at how well they're working. If someone were to drop a little leftover bit of testosterone on the ground, and I couldn't find the owner, and there weren't any trans people around, and it was about to go bad, sure, I would probably take it in the interest of preventing waste. That would just be sensible, stand to reason. If for some reason I were forced to take testosterone, I don't know why, someone might be forced, but it might happen, I would of course make the best of a bad situation and comply with good cheer. There's no point in complaining when someone comes to your house and forces you to take testosterone. I'd be remarkably sanguine about the whole thing, a model of radical acceptance. These things happen sometimes for any number of reasons. One reads about it. Yes, I'm quite prepared to be forced to take hormones if it ever comes to that, but I wouldn't go out of my way for them. Oh God, hormones would ruin my life. I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound dramatic, but hormones would ruin my life dramatically. <laughs> Obviously, they're great for other people. I think everyone should get the chance to try hormones, except for me. I'm the only person who shouldn't take hormones. God, can you imagine me on hormones? Because I imagine it all the time. And I know it would be terrible. No, I've given it a lot of thought, and I know that testosterone therapy would destroy all my personal relationships, ruin my sex life, devastate my plans for the future, render me permanently unhappy and unlovable, and otherwise set off a series of unmitigated disasters that I would regret for the rest of my days. But you look great. <laughs> Perfectly content as I am, not needing hormones, nor wanting them, prepared to take them cheerfully under duress, planning ahead for said duress, secure in the knowledge that they would ruin my life and that I've never wanted them for even a moment. How do you feel about hormones now? Just, you know, give me more. Like, okay. if there's a new one, I'd like to see some new ones. I would try, try them all. Cool. Well, we will work on that. It's worth, it's worth giving it a try. How do you feel about hormones? Do you want any? I have uh, some. I'm at the age where I need more to build muscles. Yeah. Me too. Cool, cool. We can... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I can do this afterwards. <laughs> um, so this book is more than just about your personal life. It's interlaced with these interludes. I'm wondering if like, they're like random or there's some theme to them. Yeah, a, a lot of my work historically has been about uh, reckoning with the sort of like classic 
Western literary canon that I was raised on. Um, and that's what I've done often in my own work before transition. And one of the things that often came to mind during my transition was my own relationship to various um, fictional literary characters as well as like authors or, or, or other um, figures in like religion or mythology that loomed large in my life and trying to see like if I had developed any kind of a changing relationship to any of them. So uh, a lot of the interludes are about revisiting um, figures that have been uh, a pretty big feature of my work. Like I I've done a lot of work with Anne of Green Gables um, and so having her in the book like being begrudgingly accepted by uh, Marilla and, and, and Rachel Lind uh, felt both like fun, playful, and also uh, like something that I had kind of experienced. Like these are the touchstones that I uh, sort of gauge myself against. And if I change, how do they change? Cool. Um, speaking of relationships with fictional characters, you wrote a book called Text from Jing Iyer. Mm -hmm. Yes. A lot of your previous work is about inhabiting the voices of other people. I'm wondering how different is that when writing a book from a more personal space? Yeah, so it, it's very much true that like impersonation, um, caricature, um, trying to inhabit the voice of something else, someone else, um, has been a, a huge part of my work. And I don't want to uh, oversimplify it by saying something like, all trans people become great mimics because we have to mimic stuff all the time to like get by. I think there's some truth to that or there can be some truth to that, but I don't think that that's only it but but I will say that as a person who was growing up with a sense of like what am I who's to say what do other people seem to think let's do that um, I, I had a sort of natural outgrowth of that impulse uh, was a desire to, to mimic and, and to do voices and I think too like doing voices doing imitations is a like fun and easy and non-threatening way to try on different identities as a young person that don't necessarily get you like reproved so like when I was 11 I started doing an impression of Elvis singing the Gilligan's Island theme song, and it was great, because everyone was like, that's so cute. And I was like, yes, I'm a charismatic, sexy gentleman. Um, uh, and, and so I also like marked some of those changes, like um, testosterone therapy changes your voice. So I realized one day I could no longer do the voice of Miranda from Sex and the City, which made me so sad. But then I realized I had a really great Steve. <laughs> And like Steve is such a non-entity, like no one has an impression of Steve from Sex and the City in their back pocket, but like I do now. <laughs> And it's, I can, I, I can actually only do him saying Miranda. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the show, but he's just like, he has this very like wet voice. It's hard to explain. It's like, Miranda. <laughs> and I just, um, it's like he's talking to an old version of me that I still feel fondly towards, but is now like an ex-girlfriend that I raise a child with. I forget what your original question was, but I think that I've answered it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Of course. <laughs> Why and when did you decide to start writing about your personal life? Um, uh, you know, I think with the newsletter that I, I started writing after we closed to the toast, the Shatner Chatner, um, which is like I, I, genuinely like, again, this is before I started to, to think about transition consciously. This was just like, I'm going to start a newsletter about all my strange and upsetting feelings about like the person of William Shatner, which like clue phone, it's for you. Um, and so I think I was already finding myself uh, writing more than I had anticipated about like my relationship to mirrors or my own appearance or my own work. Um, and so I found it coming up more and more often. And so I, I think usually whatever book I'm trying to sell is just what I'm thinking about the most at the time. So it, it felt to me like what I wanted more than anything was to write a series of essays that matched in some part what I was doing in that newsletter. Um, and of course, uh, you know, anytime you shift from writing about other people to writing about yourself, there's always the question of how much do I want to disclose? Um, what's the line for me between um, being honest versus being overly confessional? Um, and so one of the things that was really important to me to do in this book was to pick like a season in my life um, that I wanted to uh, examine really thoroughly. Um, and I knew I wanted to talk very intimately and in great detail about what I was feeling and thinking at the time and in relatively sparse detail about like who was in my life at the time or what were we doing. So um, I, I think knowing like I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about particular relationships. I'm not going to go into detail about like dates and activities um, that knowing that I would keep that private part to myself uh, made it a lot easier to say like, but we're going to go all in on like how I wouldn't clean my room because I was punishing the universe for not making me look like Brendan Fraser circa 1997. Um, 
so I, I think that was helpful in terms of deciding what do I want to share, what do I want to keep for myself. Is this a boundary that changes as you write more and more, or just day one you've stuck with it? I do think one of the things that is hard about autobiographical writing is there's often a quick reward for disclosure, which sometimes is, is simply somebody saying, I have felt this way too, thank you. Sometimes it's the whole sort of like, you're so brave thing, which is like, I am brave, thank you. <laughs> I've only told you the stuff about myself that I've already deemed acceptable for public consumption, but like, yes, this is me. Um, and that's not always hard, or I'm sorry, it's not always easy to recognize, it just feels good. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I'm trying to remain aware of right now is there will always be a part of my brain that when I feel like I'm being, when I'm offering a disclosure and being met with, thank you, this is so interesting, thank you for sharing, you're so brave, I'm like, oh, I'll tell you fucking everything. <laughs> um, and, and I know that that's not sustainable and that can also be um, painful as a person who also wants to have a private life some of the time. Um, so trying to figure out, you know, when do you say, this has been a really great party and it's time to go home for the day? Um, Historically, I have not had a great sense of when a party is over. <laughs> and so um, I, it is something that I try to balance, and I try to look at other writers whose careers I've admired, uh, especially writers who have been writing for you know more than a decade and aren't just like coming hot out the gate with like, here's everything about me, um, because I, I want to know what it looks like to write over the course of a lifetime and not feel like, oh, God, I kept nothing for just myself. Who are these other writers that influenced you? Um, in, in terms of just like people whose choices about personal disclosures I admire, um, I think of Morgan Page. She's a trans historian whose, whose work I love. And um, she has been out for a really long time compared, I mean, given that she is a, you know, young and stylish person. Um, and, and she's someone who's thought really carefully about like building a sustainable life and, and about separating the public from the private. Um, and so I really, really admire the ways in which she is often um, really engaging, really honest, really open, and other ways in which she makes it really clear like, nope, that's not for anyone but me and the people in my life. Um, there's certainly lots and lots of other writers who have influenced me on a number of other grounds, but in terms of like her personal relationship to her own work, her own persona, her own reputation, her own privacy. Um, I think she looms pretty large for me. I see. Are there other trans writers that you're a big fan of? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mentioned, there's a quote in here from a friend of mine, Julian K. Jarbo, um, that I love, and I love his work. He's got a book coming out in a couple of, two months, I think, maybe next month even, called Everyone on the Moon is Essential Personnel. And um, I, I met him really through his column, The Care and Feeding of Your Sex Change, which is an interview series that they do with um, people, uh, trans people, about like their relationship to food and to cooking, which I love and is fabulous. Um, Certainly, my, my, my partner, Grace Lavery, um, uh, is a trans writer I, I deeply admire. I love Susan Stryker's work. Um, I, I admire that deeply. Um, I, again, she's a, she's a I, I don't want to call her a historian, because I, I can't promise you that I know exactly what her field is, but she does a lot of wonderful, remarkable historical work. And um, I, I find that can be really helpful, because there's a part of me that thinks, like, I invented transitioning four years ago when I started it. <laughs> and um, I think some of that can be born from the kind of isolation that a lot of us can experience growing up trans and, and not seeing other people. Um, and I am also very aware that that part of my brain is mistaken okay. and um, ahistorical and requires a lot of context to be reminded. I'm like, no, you stupid himbo. You did not invent this. <laughs> um, I am a self-described, self-identified himbo. I'm allowed to use that word. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm so sorry, you're all like serious Google employees and I just said, I just said himbo to you, but you're welcome. Um, yeah, I, I think it's really, really helpful. I think sometimes too, there's, there's a tendency if somebody else says like, I bet you're the first trans person to do this. It's like, thank you for the compliment. I'm sure that's true. Almost never is that true. Yeah. So many trans people have done so many things. Um, and, and those stories aren't often told or, or, or um, like publicized, but, but that history is there and it's present. And so it's a really useful corrective to me when I want to think like, I bet I'm the first trans guy who ever like, ate a sandwich today or whatever. Yeah. Just like, nope, you're not the first and that's fine. Like, you're part of a rich and exciting community with a lovely and fantastic and storied history um, and you don't need to try to um, 
make yourself additionally special by thinking you, you, you should be seeking out more community rather than trying to establish yourself as more unique. I see. So other than just telling you that you're the first, what is something else you think cis people should understand? Oh, golly. You know, <laughs> it depends. It very much depends on the cis person. Like, yeah. you know, um, I, I, I think sometimes somebody will ask me a question like that, and it, it, it can feel a little bit like, are we fucking up? Do you need to yell at us? And, and I think I mostly want to... Um, uh, not try to like offer blanket rulings. Um, sometimes, certainly, I think, especially with like really well, well-meaning cis people, my my main thing is like you can relax, um, because uh, sometimes I'll meet somebody where like that anxiety is really present, and I'm like, you're doing great. If you're if you if you're not doing great, I'll let you know. I I'm not looking for a reason to bite your head off, um, and and I think trying to encourage cis people to help find a sense of scale um, where it's something in between like yes if like five years from now you're still calling me by my birth name every day we will have a problem but like if you you know slip up one time and then correct yourself you don't have to like you know send me flowers the next day or like run away like we're good um, so all of which is to say depends on the cis person um, sometimes it would just be like I like your shoes yeah, I actually do like your shoes. I was noticing them earlier in the elevator. Um, I do like your shoes. <laughs> I don't know if we can get a close-up on the shoes, but they're, they're quite nice. Thank you. I appreciate it. Where did you get them? Uh, Nordstrom. I love Nordstrom. They are a great department store for trans people. I don't know if you all know this, but like historically, um, they've got real, real friendly personnel, and they don't ask a lot of questions. So like, if you're not out yet, and you're like, I sure want to go shopping somewhere where they're probably going to be chill, I can't obviously guarantee everyone's personal experience, but like, great returns policy, super chill. Compared to other department stores, my personal experience there has been very, very nice. That's really good to hear. I'm not endorsing them. They have not <laughs> sponsored my transition in any way. Your experience may vary. Would you like them to? I think this is a good time to ask. I am always looking for sponsors for my transition. Transition's expensive, and I like to look cute. So <laughs> anyone who wants to give me money, please do. Cool. Um, well, there's one thing I did not understand about this book. Hit me with it. Okay, You spent an entire chapter talking about how William Shatner is a beautiful lesbian. Yeah. <laughs> and I say I'm going to prove it, but I don't prove it. Okay. Yeah. Is that, was that your question? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I don't understand. Well, you also said Chris Pines is a beautiful lesbian. Is it like just people who played? That seems super straightforward to me. <laughs> um, yes, I'm happy to go into a bit more detail. I talk about this a little bit in the book. Part of what I meant by that is like when I thought I was a girl, I was like, I'm Captain Kirk. And so that's the closest that I could get to is like, what am I? I think people seem to call me a lesbian a lot. That's probably it. We're the same. Um, but, but what I'm talking about in part, um, I, I think, is the relationship that that show has to a, a certain kind of um, female sociality or, or feminized sociality. So I think about something like famously when he was on that show, his weight fluctuated a lot. And famously, he was forced to wear a girdle and like dealt with a lot of like shitty studio notes, which is certainly something that I think historically like we think of when we think of like glamorous divas and not necessarily like guys who run an action adventure TV show. Um, but I also think about the way that like the structure is set up on the Enterprise, which is just like, it's a thruple. Again, I'm sorry, like I, it, it is three girlfriends. It is Spock, Bones, and Kirk, and they travel around the galaxy visiting their ex-girlfriends, all of whom have PhDs in science, and being like, thank you so much for being part of my journey. <laughs> and like, by the way, do you like my moto boots? And they're like, yes, I do love your moto boots. Say hi to your two girlfriends. And it's like, thank you, we're all on a journey. <laughs> like, it's, it, it is what it is, you know? And, and, and so I think, um, uh, especially, the, I don't know if, if many of you are familiar with the original series, but the very last episode of the show that ever aired is like a master class in what I like to call autoandrophilia, which I say very tongue in cheek, by the way. It's not a real thing and it's bad. Um, but it essentially, like, has to do with, like, kind of like troubling old attempts to classify different types of trans people um, and, and the idea that like if you were a trans person who ended up straight you were fine and if you didn't like you were a troubling other sort of a thing and so that episode is about one of Kirk's ex-girlfriends who's so mad at him 
for being a man and also so jealous of him for being a man and also so desperate for that sweet Kirk body that she puts herself in his body and then the whole rest of the episode it's like this crazy delusional woman thinks she's Captain Kirk and I like screenshot it and I was like it me <laughs> Um, so it's, it's a very res it's a very transmasculine resonant episode. She's like trying to kill her ex-boyfriend and become her ex-boyfriend. And she's also mad about sexism. And she's like, is that part of it? I don't know. I can't live in a world where sexism doesn't exist. So like, does it even do me any good to like think about it? And then at the end she's punished and it's very like brutal and kind of sexy and like very sexist. Um, and that's the end of the show. That's the last episode that ever aired is like. Kirk's like eggy transmasculine ex tries to kill him. And I don't know a trans guy who on some level doesn't want to like, he has like one cis ex in the past that he's like, if I could turn into that guy and also fight him and also make him realize he's gay because of me, that would mean a lot. <laughs> And so I think it's a very special episode um, for a lot of us. I don't remember what your question was again. <laughs> You're delightful. Thank you. But, okay, I think I understand what a beautiful lesbian is now. You know, and if you don't, I will write you a, a, another essay. Goodbye. <laughs> I, I realize that was a lot. I get it. No, they have a meeting. <laughs> it's 1.30, they have a meeting. Listen. I would like to believe it was because of uh, <laughs> the Star Trek realness they just had to absorb. Um, if you ever want to watch the episode, let me know. I'm always down to rewatch. Cool, cool. Switching gears for a second, uh, the toast was one of my favorite things on the internet. Thank you so much. And my favorite, Mine too. My favorite article, it's as a father of daughters, and I also really like the one about um, playing devil's advocate. And basically, these are things sometimes people, stupid things that people say when they're discussing gender issues. I'm wondering if there are like, things people should stop saying. I, I, I also loved those pieces. In case you're not familiar, one of them was like, as a father of daughters, I finally realized I shouldn't run women down on the road and then use their livers to build a ziggurat in my backyard. <laughs> Couldn't possibly have known that, but now that I have daughters, I get it. Um, and, and I think part of what feels important to me is I, I, I want to um, take certain expressions that I hear a lot and like massage them out into a position of absurdity. I, I think that's a useful, thank you very much. Although my previous water was lemongrass and strawberry and this just looks like street brand water. So <laughs> this is a real downgrade. No, don't, don't. I'm not that much of a diva. I will get some more fancy water before I leave. Um, <laughs> I, so I, I, I enjoy, I think, taking phrases that get used often and, and taking them to absurd conclusions. I think that's a useful and interesting experiment and worth doing. I don't necessarily want to act then like a cop and say, like, this expression is now off limits. If you say it, you will be thrown out of the room. So much as I want to add a little depth and a little strangeness to that particular conversation. So. Uh, certainly, I don't think there's anything wrong with like a cis guy coming to a new understanding of his relationship with women if he has a daughter. That makes sense to me. That seems, uh, you know, it would be rather odd if it didn't change anything. Mm -hmm. But I also think that there are ways um, to talk about that a little bit slapdashedly or a little bit lazily or a little bit like, boy, we can't just make everyone have a daughter to like arrive at this conclusion. So like, what else can we do? Um, to to convince like mm -hmm. a, a number of guys to think about women as as, as full people, um, uh, or or the devil's advocate, yeah, like um, it's often an expression that's thrown about like quickly and without a lot of thought, and it means like get ready, I'm going to be mean to you, and you have to pretend <laughs> that that's fun. Um, so it, it's really not, and I think that, that that goes back to what you were saying earlier about like what would you say to cis people? I feel like sometimes the desire is like tell us the ten things we must not say, give us a list of the forbidden words, and then we can just abide by that code and we will be safe. Certainly, I think there's language that is useful to adopt as communities, um, or to to. Uh, not adopt as communities, but uh, more than say this, don't say that, you're right to say this, you're wrong to say that, you're smart to say this, you're dumb to say that. Um, I just think it's useful to um, think really critically about maybe a phrase that we've heard a lot before um, and to ask like, what work is this phrase standing in for? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that said, 
I, I do have a section of the book where I talk about when cis people use language, like it feels like someone died to talk about someone's transition. And again, I'm careful there to say like it's, because I know some, like there's going to be someone who's like, oh, now I can't have feelings. And it's like, yeah, you can have whatever feelings you want. I'm not going to take them away from you. Um, but I, I do go into in the book part of why I think it's, um, even if you want to talk about pain or loss or grief, I think it is better to use language that is not connected to the rituals of death. Um, because for me and for, I, I, I think, pretty much all trans people, um, transition is not the work of death. It is creative. It is energetic. Um, it is ambitious. It moves us in the direction of life. Um, and so while changes can sometimes be fraught or painful for someone who has known one a long time, um, I, I think it is better to find other ways to express um, complexity or sadness um, that don't invoke the funereal. Um, so I, I, I would say that's the one thing that I would really encourage people to, to move away from. Because it's like, it feels like someone died. Well, someone didn't, so sorry. Like, you know what I mean? Like, someone literally yeah. didn't die. I'm like very literally alive. I, you know. That's much harder than just having a list of words I can't say. Yeah, yeah. And I, th I do think sometimes people respond to an invitation to rethink language they use as an attempt to say, like, you will be, like, carried outside by the 1984 police if you say it again. And they're like, then they'll cling to it all the harder, like, you're trying to take this from me. And it's like, I'm inviting you to put something down and see what you can do with having your hands free. Yeah, that's pretty deep. Um, <laughs> wow. I'm actually happy to read from that section if yeah, cool. if you're amenable. Yeah. Um, I'll just do a quick paragraph or two. I don't have to find it because I still don't know where anything is in this book. Oh, I talk about the Adams family. They're so trans. <laughs> that was fun. That was really fun. Here we go. Yeah, so I talk, I, I don't know if any of you are, are familiar with the scene from Tom Sawyer where they think the kids are dead. They have a funeral and then the kids are like, just kidding, we're alive. I, I, I like that scene a lot. Um, a particularly thorny modern question of etiquette is how to properly receive, as an alive person who has recently advertised either an intention to transition or that transition has already begun, any variation on the following sentiment. It feels like someone died. Sometimes people are willing to be more specific and clarify, it feels like you, the transitioning person, died. Or possibly it feels like my spouse, parent, child, sibling, friend died. But more often than not, I think, non-transitioning people prefer the safety of announcing the death of someone rather than name the transitioner outright. It serves as a softer replacement for, you're dead to me as the speaker lacks either de the desire or the determination to simply announce an estrangement. It feels like someone died. I won't say who. You know who I'm talking about, the party of the first part, but let's not speak ill of the dead. One worries that responding with the good news that one is not dead at all, but very much alive, that one is, in fact, moving in the direction of vitality, animation, the future, developing a new kind of continuity, carrying on the good work of naming and identification that all people have been charged with, would not be received with wonder and relief. Yet, like Tom Sawyer listening to his Aunt Polly reproach herself after believing him to have drowned, the temptation remains to rush out from under the bed and overwhelm them with joy. But how to talk someone who loves you out of grief? One might argue, I'm not dead or anything like it, you're mistaken. Or persuade, I'll be just around the corner from my old life. Come by and visit any time. Or demand or manipulate or threaten or cajole. Try to strike some sort of bargain. What if I were to transition as little as possible? Might my condition be upgraded merely to some sort of serious but non-fatal complaint? How does one behave as a guest at one's own funeral? Thank you. Uh, speaking of things that are not dead, in the past you mentioned that you use GChat as part of your writing process for text from Gene Iyer. Mm -hmm, yes. Are you still using GChat or whatever we're calling it now? Oh, this is, <laughs> I'm so glad you asked me that. This is one of the most embarrassing aspects of my transition. So I've changed my name now twice, mm -hmm. um, but only once legally. I'm still waiting on getting the formal paperwork back, but legally, once the state of California proves that my name will be Daniel M. Mallory. Uh, nope, Daniel M. Lavery. <laughs> I've changed it too many times, I can't remember. Um, so I had originally gone from Mallory Orberg to Daniel Mallory Orberg, then to Daniel M. Lavery. So the first time, I changed my email address. And then I like forgot my password and the like security codes, so I tried for like eight months to try to get it back, and nothing ever worked, so I just lost it. Mm -hmm. I lost everything connected with that account, including all of my GChat contacts. We can help you. Thank you. Yeah. That would be ideal. I miss those people. Um, yeah. 
And so I just had to get a new email address and start over. And then I was like, fuck, I changed my name again. So I've been like, del- like my email address is still my second name because I'm like, I don't want to do that again. It's a whole mess. Sorry. I'm glad I'm, glad I'm at Google, though. Like, I really would yeah. like those old GChat contacts back. Let's talk after this. <laughs> and then we'll get hormones and go weightlifting. Yes. <laughs> so this is a question I've been wanting to ask. Uh, have you met a Neil Dash? Yes, ages ago yeah. in New York when I was there on tour, I think, for my first book. We had coffee. He mm-hmm. was very nice to me. Did he talk about Prince a lot? He did talk about yeah. Prince a lot. Um, I, I think... Son of a t- bitch. <laughs> yeah. So one time he tweeted that ironic racism is still racism. And I know, like... That's kind of true because a lot of people say awful things and they, they dodge responsibility. But on the other hand, like you do satire, so how do you decide like what's good irony, which is and what is it like when people are just using it as an excuse to be a jerk? Sure, um, I do think a lot of my work is is parody rather than satire, which I realize is kind of a a, a fine distinction, but it's an it, it is one that matters. Um, for me, the general test is um, am I operating out of a place of contempt? Mm-hmm either towards whoever might be reading or engaging with my work um, or uh, towards the subject uh, of my work. Um, and, and if that's the answer, you know, some things are certainly worth contempt, I think. It's, it's not necessarily like, okay, if it's starting with contempt, it's bad, throw it out. But, um, you know, you have to run it through some additional tests. Um, uh, yeah, when it comes to something like ironic racism, I don't know that I've ever heard it in any way that didn't simply function as racism. So uh, simply in terms of like how it manifests in the world, it, it's it's the same thing. Um, and, and, and certainly I have also heard someone say something, um, you know, cruel, stupid, malicious, all three. And then when someone says that's stupid, cruel, and malicious, uh, to say like it's satire as if like now we're done. Um, that in fact it was smart, interesting, and thoughtful um, because I used the keyword satire. Um, uh, so, in the sense that somebody might want to try to treat that word as like a loophole or a get out of jail free card or like, you know, a, a blinding flash of glitter so that they can disappear in the smoke, um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't think that's interesting or useful. Um, I think that if you're attempting to use humor to either build an argument or, or take apart someone else's argument, um, you, you will probably also be able to do the same thing without humor if someone asks you a follow-up question. And so if someone asks you a follow-up question and all you can do is kind of sputter and say like, no, um, that might be a clue that, that you are not in fact um, attempting to utilize satire to build something. And it's, it's also like you can do interesting satire that's also um, limited or, or incomplete or that hurts someone and, and you still have to own that as a product of your own speech. So um, a- anyone who attempts to say that like satire is a unique category where you're suddenly just like um, uh, like a like like what uh, Sigourney Weaver is for Zool in Ghostbusters, where you're just like, a, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm simply a vessel for the spirit of satire, which descended upon me from on high. Like, no, you're not. Uh, speaking of people who are bad at humor, Go on. yeah, what's the secret of uh, turning Twitter humor into real life humor? I I, <laughs> I don't know. By real life, do you mean like writing a book, or by real life, do you mean being funny in person with people? Uh, either one. Because with the with that one, I I don't know that it does. I, see. I I think the kind of way of interacting with people that you do on Twitter tends to be everyone shut up. I have something to say, yeah. and um, in 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 real life, if you say that, you're quite rude. Um, so, uh, you know, I I. I I think things that work on Twitter usually don't necessarily work elsewhere automatically. It has to be adapted to the medium. Um, I don't, I, I, I do think it can be helpful for focusing and clarifying ideas um, or, or, or jokes. Um, it's like writing a lot of headlines all day, um, and that can be useful. Okay. That helps a lot. It explains a lot of my relationships. <laughs> um, so it's rather a tech company, I thought might be interesting if we talk about some tech issues that are related to the trans community. Let's do okay it. Absolutely. I would love it. Um, By the way, I hope anyone trans at Google is able to just milk the hell out of the insurance and get just like $500,000 worth of whatever. Just like, I'm going to need everything. Just 
bilk them. Uh, oh, 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 we're running out of time now. Now that I'm telling everyone to. Uh, she's <laughs> fair. Please don't tweet about that. I would never. I would never. So Google announced today that we're no longer going to label Google AI is no longer going to label genders in pe photos of people. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, th that sounds good. Um, I, I haven't heard anything beyond that, so like I, I, I can't comment further. Um, but certainly, I think anything that goes uh, like in the direction of like we're going to measure your skull shape to determine something <laughs> about you, I get nervous because of eugenics and race science, which are bad. Got I'm, I'm willing to go on the record there. <laughs> Those are bad. Oh, yeah. That's been making the rounds on Twitter lately, too, eugenics. Um, They're bad. Yes, yes, yes. It's astonishingly bad. Um, Sorry, go on. You have another question. So a lot of tech companies are putting more effort into preventing misgendering and dead naming. Um, they're doing that through features and policy. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that, too. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I've encountered the most in my own transition that has been challenging is not... Um, on any particular level with any particular company a desire to um, use my old name or leverage my old identity against me so much as like the bureaucratic weight of making that change is massive and I have to do it across so many platforms. Um, and, and that's not necessarily like one person or group is responsible for that, but it absolutely is like, I'll still get the occasional like reminder email from like some company that I had an interaction with three years ago. And I'm like, oh fuck, I gotta tell them too. Um, so anything I think that um, can automate that process or, or make it easier, make any kind of a name change easier is I think a good thing. Um, I, I recently had to like report to Twitter an account that was impersonating me, and it was hard because it was like, well, they're impersonating a name that like I've been professionally known by, but that was never my legal name. So not only do I have to provide you with like my driver's license, which has my like old old photo and my birth name, um, but I also have to find some way to prove that like the name Daniel Ortberg is one that's historically associated with me, um, and that's um, you know, it's challenging. Different trans people have different levels of like stress and distress when it comes to interacting with something like an old state ID. Depending on the day, I'm like, whatever, it's fine, I'll take a picture. And other days I'm like, this sucks. Um, so yeah, a anything that makes that process a little easier I think is a, is a really good thing. Cool. Uh, before we turn it over to the audience, the question you always ask is, what's a question that you wish interviewers would ask you? And, I'm glad uh, you noticed that yeah. I do that. And you can make this about peanut butter or not, up to you. I mean, I do enjoy a spoonful of peanut butter every now and again. Um, I think, I'm not sure, I'm, not, I'm, af I'm afraid nothing comes to mind. I feel like I've, I've told you all my opinions about everything, and now I can't think of a question that I wish that you had asked me. Oh, we can go to the audience. Let's turn it over to the audience. I have a couple of rules when it comes to Q&As. Um, the first question has to come from, some, from someone who's not a white man. Um, it has to be a question, <laughs> and it has to be one question. Those are my rules. I do want to know where you got your socks, so that is my question for you. I think it was sock dream, but my, my question is simple. Because you are trans at Google, would you like a trans at Google sticker? Yes. Okay, Thank you. Cool. That's a great question. Wait, but are you saying you got those socks in a dream? <laughs> No, it's a, it's a website called Sock Dream. I thought like maybe you dreamed them up and then you knitted them or something. I'm sorry, that makes much more sense. <laughs> I'd still like a sticker if, you, uh, if you'd allow me to have it. Thank you, that's very sweet. Hello, um, I'm a huge fan of your work as Dear Prudence, and I would love to know, do you feel like writing that column and giving so many people advice has changed you at all? Certainly, yeah. So, so one of my day jobs is I'm an, an advice columnist at Slate, um, uh, and I've been doing that for for close to four years now. Um, and absolutely, it's a it's a job where I am constantly telling people, like, obviously, do what you want, but like, here's how I think you should run the rest of your life. Um, uh, I, I think in some ways it has helped to slow me down a bit. I, I feel a little bit less like this is me, I'm going to make a joke, and if someone's feelings get hurt, we'll find out later, um, which has always been a, a tendency of mine that can sometimes lead to delight and boisterousness and can sometimes lead to, oh, I've hurt and alienated people I care about, and I wish I hadn't done that. 
Um, so I, I do think that that has helped me in part because I think the most upsetting questions to get are from someone who's like, I was 100% in the right, and then I got really, really mad, and I said something totally out of line, and now I'm only 60% in the right, and I have to apologize to someone I'm really mad at. And I always want to be able to like prevent that, because there's nothing in the world worse than apologizing to someone who you know is more wrong than you, but you still owe them an apology because you shouldn't have said what you said. Um, so that's, that's definitely something that's affected me. And, and I think, too, um, uh, as time has, has gone on through the column, I tend to, in some ways, both be quicker to suggest to somebody, like, this person is not going to get better, and, and it, it's maybe time to let them know, like, if you're ever able to, like, meet this very low bar for human interaction, give me a call, but until then, don't give me a call. Um, so I tend to be, I think, a little quicker on that when it's when it's like this person's been doing this for thirty years; they're not going to stop. Um, and also recognizing like the very real reasons why somebody might not be ready to cut ties with someone, despite knowing that it might be the best thing. And so wanting to find alternatives to, if you're not ready to do that, how can you make your life a little bit more bearable when you're interacting with them? How can you reduce your emotional investment in some of these conversations so that when they do the thing you know they're going to do that hurts you, you can be a little bit more removed? Um, and, and so I know those are slightly slightly um, uh, antithetical, but I, I, I do feel them both more strongly. Thank you. If you ever want to come on the show, we're always looking for guests. So. <laughs> I would love that. That would be awesome. <laughs> The, the day the, clo the toast closed online, I think, was one of the saddest days on the internet ever. Oh, I just went to bed. I was bummed out. But you are so consistently and precisely funny, and I'm curious about how you do it and what goes into humor for you. Well, all that work. Thank you. That was a compliment disguised as a question, <laughs> um, which technically violates my rules. But I, 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 we were actually talking about this at lunch, because... One of the things that I do is like every year or two years, I tend to be like, oh, I've learned something about myself. This is me now, like very Gene Belcher from Bob's Burgers. And I'm very like, this explains everything about me, both like good, bad, things I've struggled with, things that have come easily to me. This is why every relationship I was in before didn't work out. Like I've solved the problem of me. Um, and this is it. And so right now, that thing for me is my adult ADHD diagnosis. Like I'm like, this explains everything. <laughs> And it like feels like it does right now, but I also know in two years there's going to be a new thing. And that's I live my life in phases. Transmasculine people are all werewolves. Um, <laughs> we get hairier and more attractive over time. <laughs> so sorry. So um, one of the things that has been characteristic of like my own experience with ADHD is like constant like agitation and looking for like what's the next thing. Like where's the next like dopamine rush going to come from? Um, and that has often I think shown up in my desire to top the last thing or to write something that's more interesting than the last thing or to be funnier than the last thing was. Sometimes that can be creative and energizing and fun, and sometimes it can be exhausting and make me late for everything um, or, or turn conversations into bits, um, which some of my like dearest friends are like, you're doing a bit, and I don't want you to. Like I, I want to have dinner together. Um, so... Um, I, I, I think very much like the way in which like I have I have grown up unmedicated with ADHD and have only very recently changed that. Um, I, I think that has a lot to do with um, the fact that I tend to produce a lot of short pieces. Um, I, I think like when it comes to my relationship to my own work, it's not like. I, I write a, a long extended narrative every couple of years. It's like I have books come out with lots of little things in them. And in between, I write you know, an advice column that publishes several times a week, a newsletter that publishes several times a week, lots of little jokes on Twitter, um, because that's the way that my, my mind um, feels the most both like energized, stimulated, like it's working properly, and also like I can relax. Like I don't have to write a novel which of course is why my next book is going to be a novel and I'm supposedly working on it right now. Um, I have a Dear Prudence question, if you don't mind. Uh, not at all. Okay. Do you have any opinions on airplane seat etiquette? <laughs> <laughs> so, so obviously part of airplane seat etiquette is a trap, right? Because the two main problems are like, one, plane travel is a huge contributor to like devastating climate change mm -hmm. and like we, we kind of need to stop. Mm -hmm which is like 
terrifying to contemplate because like how how's that going to work i have no idea um, and the second is obviously like the problem is that the companies attempt to shove too many people into tiny like non like spaces the size that's like designed to turn life into a cage match do you know what i mean like people are packed in um in ways that like disrespect the human body especially like bodies that aren't very small um so like when you get on a plane in in a certain way like everybody's already like the company is like we're taking away this much dignity this much personal space and so everyone's like well i can't yell at the ceo of delta but like the person behind these knees are digging into my back and that makes me mad or like the person in front of me reclined and now my knees are in the back of the chair and those are all understandable discomforts and so I guess I would say basically it will help when you step onto a plane to think like we are all engaged with suffering for the next four to 12 hours. And it's not suffering that we would have created for ourselves under different circumstances where we were put in charge. Um, and so I would say to be as patient as you can with other suffering creatures and also to be patient with yourself um, and uh, hope that the plane doesn't crash also. I get really nervous on airplanes. So I think I also tend to just be like, of course I'm uncomfortable. We're all going to die. Like, we're in the sky, and we shouldn't be, and I'm scared. So my my thing on planes is just like, I'm, I'm just crying the whole time. On that note, let's thank Danny for coming. <laughs> <laughs>